Welcome to the Put On Waivers Media Group, home of the Put On Raiders Podcast and the Student Body Right Podcast. This is your place for the best breakdowns and the best insight for those who fight on and bleed silver and black. Now, here are your hosts, Dwayne Douglas and Ryan Holmes. And welcome, everybody, to a glorious episode of the Student Body Right USC podcast. I'm your host, Dwayne Douglas, and I am podcasting off the beautiful shores of the Pacific Ocean. Beautiful day uh, here in Southern California. If you like rain, it rains for an entire day. Nothing like having a day off, and it rains your entire day off. Um, but I, but I, can't give, I can't complain too much about the weather out right here. I am Evan Desai here, who joins us here from time to time, contributing, contributing to the podcast. Um, you can catch him at Evan K. Desai, D E. S A I um on Twitter among other places. How you doing today, Evan? I'm good, bro. How are you? Good. Um the schedule. I don't think we talked since the schedule came out, right? So let me let me just pull up the schedule here too as well. Like what are your um thoughts about the schedule? Um it sounds like you know this kind of stemmed from I think B, I think they had such a situation with BYU, but BYU turned the went to whatever with uh, big 12 um looks like um for them but now they had they had they play san jose state in uh in week zero if you will and then after that it looks like it's going to be some interesting you know long stretch of of games here for in a row for for usc um coming down the stretch after their um week four bye yeah i mean my first like reaction was obviously just like kind of taking a look at that two by situation that you kind of alluded to and that everyone's talking about. You know, you got the week zero, you're gonna have your two out, of, you're gonna have two out of conference games to start the year. You know, two cupcake games, and then the Stanford game, of course, that has to happen early. And it's a bye week, and then it's that nine nine game stretch that a lot of people are kind of not exactly excited about. Um, especially seeing kind of towards that second half of that nine game stretch, being against some really tough teams, some tough competition. Um, kind of being seen as some upset opportunities there. And, you know, questions of, you know, is USC going to be able to handle that, going to be able to handle nine straight conference games with the one non-conference game being, you know, a big rivalry in Notre Dame. Too, it should be pretty good next year. But I also just think that there are some, I mean, I think there can be benefits too of having that early bye week. You know, like I, I personally like the, the first half of the season being so easy to an extent because, that gives the opportunities for everyone to kind of gel together. That gives opportunities for a lot of guys to play, even if they're not starting. Mm-hmm. You know, if we can get Miller Moss in every game, that's that might be a little bit of a stress, but if we get Miller Moss in every game, that's a great thing for this program. You know, being able to get guys like that experience, valuable experience. So that's going to be huge, kind of get the team going, build that chemistry, build that culture, you know, in the beginning of that season. And I'm not necessarily so sure that the bye week being early is such a bad thing. When you get a few games, kind of process how everything's going, you get to make early adjustments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe if we had a bye week early this year, we would have been able to kind of keep up what we were doing in the beginning of the season defensively. Whereas, you know, as soon as we just kind of got a little bit tired, things weren't necessarily going well, and then we kind of just fell on our faces in that second half of the season. So I think there could be benefits to it as well. Maybe they should just play Utah first because Utah seems they yeah. get they get so in they get so injured after you after they play Utah. I think both teams get banged up after that game, so just got to get that game over um, early as possible. But um, San Jose State in August, I, I don't mind having a game in late August um, to get to get to get to get the party started for, um, rather quickly. You can you can get the chance to kind of get your feet wet. I think, and then then you get Arizona State. Arizona State's a down program. You know about you know about that right? You know about that situation out there, and then. Do you feel like it looks like, you know, in September 30th at Colorado, it doesn't seem like that's going to be a weather game. I think the only weather game looks like they might have would be at Oregon. Um, they have Washington in at, in the Coliseum. Do you feel like, because Coach Prime, I don't, I don't ever want to, I don't ever want to doubt the abilities of what, what Deion Sanders can do. I, I'm kind of I'm not surprised at what he's doing, but I'm also like I don't want to like you know is he ready for this huge jump? I mean the the transfer portal numbers are are high. I mean he he has he has one of the top top five ranked um, transfer portal num- um, um overall overall numbers as far as that goes. The rec- big time recruits are some some guys are I mean when was the last time a running back left Notre Dame? 
or shun Notre Dame to go to Colorado. Like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, not even when Eric Bieniemy was there, did that happen? So, um, mm-hmm. what were your thoughts about did, is that a game that, like, you know, sitting in the weeds, uh, another team, um, in, in the Pac 12 could really not maybe not contend year one, but just be a just be a situation where you're worried about going at Colorado now? I think if you're USC, you're probably not still because, you know, obviously USC fans know that you can kind of rebuild things, you know, at least relatively fast. If you can really nail the portal and just nail roster building in general, as soon as you get in um, to your new head coaching position with what Lincoln Riley just did and what Sonny Dykes just did too, just kind of in terms of just rebuilding TCU. Um, but the issue is that, you know, when you're coming off of a one in 11 year, you don't have much to start with. You don't have a foundation. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to say that USC had some great roster before Lincoln Riley came in. because they obviously, obviously didn't, but they still had a Brett Nealon, you know, still had an Andrew Voorhees, you know, a Tui Tui flow to Kalen Bullock. There was still like some pieces there, mm-hmm. you know, a, there were a lot of good receivers already there, for instance, you know, like there was still a foundation to a strong roster. It was then time to just build that, you know, with, Colorado, it's a complete revamp, you know, yeah. and I think that Dion has done a great job, obviously, you know, beginning that and, you know, bringing in, bringing in his, his luggage or whatever he said he yeah. had. He yeah. has certainly done a it's great Louis. job. It's Louie. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's lived up to it, you know, but it's just, you know, I, I don't think that there was a lot really to start with. And I think that's, that's going to take a little bit more time than, you know, a USC or a TCU just because of how bad they were this past year to start. And so, yeah. you know, I understand that that game's on the road and, you know, it's not going to be easy, but I just, you know, I think that Colorado will be way better this year, but I just know they'll be able to really beat, you know, a USC, even if it's on the road, um, you know, especially because USC should probably be pretty rested by then because they get that early bye week, you know, so I don't think there'll be too many injury concerns, hopefully at that point. So yeah. I still roll with USC pretty comfortably. Yeah, um, Arizona. I think we, I think we, th- we all think we all see Arizona as a team that's coming on the rise, and the in the Pac-12, um, Notre Dame. They got a they got a quarterback who, now who is going to be probably um, drafted in the top fifteen in the National Football League um, when he when he decides to come out. So that's going to be a good game. And then you have you know Utah Heat, Utah in the Coliseum. So I've mentioned this before, and I'm 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 said, I'm, I'm, I talk about it over and over again, like. They, I think, I'm not sure w- w- if it's going to just continue when they go to the big, when they go to the big 10, but like, how do you, if Notre Dame is not going to be in a conference and they're not going to be part of any conference, it's going to be the independent Notre Dame thing. Like, how do we keep, like, why are you putting your national championship hopes in jeopardy by playing Notre Dame every year? Like, I mean, like, I mean, and then like, I mean, like what, 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 like, I'm not, I'm not people, I've, I've called for the end of the game end of this game forever until they join a conference they're not they're not too good to join a conference i'm kind of tired of them being this independent entity you can still have nbc whatever whatever but like join the big 10 they're dying to have you there like you know what i'm saying like it, it would make it would make you put you put um ohio state and um michigan on one side then you put you know usc and ucla and Notre Dame on the other side then that's that's a mega conference like that's a conference you can contend with with the sec um, this whole thing where they're going to where they, they want to stay independent, I think it's kind of crazy. We have thoughts about like continuing to play Notre Dame because if Notre Dame isn't on this schedule, the schedule is a lot more manageable. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you bring up you brought up the NBC there for a little bit because I mean now the Big Ten is going to be partnering with the NBC shortly. You know, um, you know they have that deal with NBC. They have a deal with everybody. You know, so yeah, it's just basically yeah. like you know the media deal that's going towards the Big Ten. It should be really attractive to Notre Dame because one of the parts they love about being independent is NBC and that is an advantage for them. Um, but no, I mean, the whole independent thing is just kind of a joke anyway. I don't, I don't know why they're independent. I don't know why that's a thing. No one seems to respect it anywhere outside of South Bend. So yeah. that is what it is. And, you know, but I understand what you're saying about just scheduling in general, you know, with it being tough like that, because I mean, you know, the, the thing that always makes it so that USC obviously can play Notre Dame, despite them not being the Pac-12 or anything, is because, you know, Stanford also plays Notre Dame. So you have the USC Stanford game early and you find a way to mix in that Notre Dame game like the middle of the season um, or may, maybe, you know, rivalry week if it kind of permits. But, you know, now that's just going to – things are going to get further complicated now with Stanford and USC not in the same conference. So you got to work out schedule between the Pac-12 and the Big Ten. It's USC-Stanford plus this independent entity that, that Notre Dame is. 
And I mean, I, I think it's, I really think it's about time for Notre Dame to, to go to the big 10. Obviously. I mean, I basically always thought that, but like, I mean, right now, all the signs kind of point to that. They need to do it. Yeah. The issue is, is I remember a long, long time ago that there was like something about how they need to join the big 10. There was like a movement, like amongst like some fans that like the old heads just like decided they couldn't do it or whatever, for whatever reason, it's breaking tradition. And so I, I, I just never know what to predict when it comes to them and finally just deciding to join a conference, just be normal like the rest of us. <laughs> it's funny that um, I just, I was, I was scrolling through um, Twitter, not Instagram. And like you go through reels sometimes you get lost in reels. So I, so I, I got I to I put my phone down. But um, this lady said that she, she, she made a remark about tradition to her son and her son told her tradition is just pressure being put on you by dead people. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's actually pretty good I mean, when, when we think about it. But I mean, there are some things that like with, with, with tradition that you like, that thing is like, I mean, I don't, I love the, when the uniforms are on TV together, it's special. It's kind of cool to watch it. That game last year was a probably the best game. They probably the most complete game um, USC played all last year, but it's just, it's just time cousin. It's, it, it, it's time to end that. Um, I guess I'll take, you can take USC really seriously. And I was talking to talk to, talk to people in my USC group, or whatever, um, that well, they are, they're holding out for the game on October 21st when they play Utah. They said, we beat Utah, I'll take, I'll take us seriously. Um, because that is going to be the game where it's going to be, it's going to be physical. Cam Rising is going to be back. Um, we'll see what, you know, we'll see what transfers come into Utah because when USC gets transfers, it's NIL, End of the end of the free world. Not to mention, <laughs> not to mention, but but you know, um, Dylan um, 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 Kincaid wasn't a, wasn't a, wasn't ground up grassroots recruit from Utah. He was a transfer from San Diego, and nobody talks about how Cam Rising was a transfer from somewhere else either. But whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. But um, that that's the game that's going to probably be the most. I could see the crowd being just the vitriol from the crowd is going to be absolutely nuts in the Coliseum for that game because they've become the hated rival. And what Stanford used to be with um, with um, with their head coach just being physical and run the football using USC and give them a hard time, like Harbaugh did, um, like the other coach did. I forgot, I forgot his name now. He's not there anymore. Um, but, you know, but but this is what they have to do to, to, to get through the Pac-12 is, is show that they can beat Utah. Utah's going to – I think Utah's going to have two or three losses this, this year. I don't think Utah's ever going to be a team that um, contends for a national championship, but – they can help. They can do a good job of stopping USC from getting the one if they if, if USC can't deal with that physicality that they that they have up there in um in Salt Lake City. Yeah, no question. You know, I kind of agree with that. You know, you got to take USC seriously if they can go ahead and beat Utah. And you know, because so Utah is the ninth game of the season, correct? Correct. Let's see. Yep. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's nice ninth. Yep, ninth game. Okay, so then correct me if I'm wrong, but the the next three games after that would be Washington at home, Oregon on the road, UCLA at home, right? Yeah, you, you um you mixed um you messed you you forgot Cal. Okay, there's Cal in there. Is that is yeah. Cal right after Utah? Cal's right after Utah at Cal. If, if it matters, I don't think it matters if you're at Cal. I'm sorry, it's no, yeah. no, no offense to the Golden Bears, but just hey, you'll have half USC <laughs> fans. In the yeah, seriously. But um, you know, I think that the way that things set up is that you know if you can go. You know, if you can be 8-0 up through that Utah game and you get that win at home, you know, you kind of establish, like you said, like, you know, kind of a rowdy kind of atmosphere, you know, a lot going on. That's a that's a huge momentum pick, pick up to be able to have that, not only that 8-0 stretch, but, you know, to be able to be 5-0 and since the bye week yeah. and to be able to have, you know, you, it, let's say if you're undefeated, as we're assuming, you got a big win against Notre Dame, they went against Utah. Then you're looking at those next, you know, few games. They don't be tough. Oregon, Washington, UCLA, but the physicality part of it has already passed you. That's yeah. not to say that Oregon and Washington they can't be physical or whatever, but it's just like they are not. They don't have a physical identity. Whereas, you know, that's what Notre Dame and Utah are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So if you can kind of get past, get over that hump, that's huge. And then you're looking at it. So you have Cal in there. But then after that, you're so you're looking at okay, well, can we get three out of the next four after the Utah game? Cal. Washington, Oregon, UCLA. I think you absolutely can. You know, that's all you need. Three out of the next four, you win the Pac-12 chip, you're in the playoff. You know, so 
Can you win three out of those next four? If I just won eight straight, including Notre Dame on the road and Utah, who just won the last three times we played them, I'm feeling pretty confident about that coming in. So from a fan standpoint, the coaching standpoint, the culture with the team, the players, yeah, if they can get through that, those first eight games, take Utah, obviously having already beat Notre Dame in the cold uh, up in South Bend, I think that would just be a complete momentum, really momentum changer. And um, I think it really kind of set a narrative for how close they really are. Yep. And, you know, I think it's going to get the players up. You know, they're going to be feeling it. Things are going to feel a little bit different from last year. You know, I think the roster, they're probably going to be feeling more confident in the roster that they got. And, yeah, I, th- I think definitely you got to take USC seriously after that. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think I think that's the game. I think I kind of agree. I think I'm going to hold out um, my feelings, really true feelings about this team until they show that show, show they can beat um, the Utes. Um, so what, you know, Michael Lombardi, who covers the National Football League um, and college football, all has has this saying where if you want to play good defense, you got to play less defense. So it was, you know, which is, which, which I totally get. So with Kingston, White, Dietrich, Mohan, and, and, and Tarquin, like this is an absolute, and they have depth because they have Cooper Lovelace, people like that as well too. So, so you do, so if you had a sustained injury, you know, you, you can, you know, you can, you know, ho- hopefully, you know, um, for a couple of weeks, you can, you can deal with that. But this is an absolute massive GT counter freaking defense you know, offensive line here, and I think that you know, I mean, later this week I got I got a breakdown of the of the of the running back from um, South Carolina who joined, and also um, you know Jones is Jones is back. Like I mean, the, the, you know, Relique Brown behind little 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 Relique Brown behind this huge offensive line. I mean, if you you know, I mean. It's it's gonna be interesting to see what they can do. What are your thoughts about them just getting massive offensive line help um, to help the running game and help Caleb Williams? I think it's I think it's pretty massive, both figuratively and literally. You know, it's, it's yeah. massive just to be able to be able to reload and really even potentially improve the offensive line, which I think you know there's a good chance this offensive line does improve um, based on what it already was last year, which is pretty solid. And then obviously the players are massive. You know, you look at the projected starting five. I mean, that, that's not a typical Pac-12 offensive line. No. Let me, let me just say that. Yes. <laughs> you know, just, the thing is, like, the, the, why this is all so valuable is because so many of these guys can play different positions. And that's what you want on your offensive line because that's how you create depth. Like, let's go down the list. Like, um, you know, Jonah Monheim, he can play multiple positions. Uh, he can play guard and tackle. Justin Diaz, you can play guard and center. Um, you know, uh, Jared Kingston, he can play tackle and guard. Mason Murphy, there's talks about him maybe – obviously playing tackle, but potentially switching in and getting kicked in to play guard. Like all these guys can play different positions. That's really, really valuable. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how you create depth because you have so many different combinations you can use on your offensive line, which really didn't have come into last year. Coming into last year, um, I, well, Jonah Monheim was a guy who obviously could play multiple positions, but like you kind of knew where everyone was going to be playing. Mm-hmm. And it was just, you didn't really have a ton of depth. You're like hoping guys like Gino Canones, um, you're hoping guys like uh, like Jason Rodriguez, those guys kind of really step up if they ever have to be used and, and come in. And we saw that at times, like Mason Murphy towards the end of the season, you know, especially in that bowl game, I thought he looked pretty good. But at times, you know, he just kind of had some kind of young guy, young player mistakes, you know, because that stuff happens. You know, at this point, there's a lot of depth. There's a lot of versatility. There's a lot of size. There's a lot of experience. So there's really nothing you can say against this offensive line. No. And the thing is, it could even get better when the next transfer portal window opens. And I do think I think I think I think that about the Florida kids who came over, because they played with Richardson, I think it's a plus because they yeah. play they play with a guy who can move around, who who's not necessarily going to be if the ball if the play doesn't work and the ball he has to and Caleb has to hold the ball a little bit longer, and move around and make plays with his feet, extend the plays like they're used to guys doing that like they they're used to playing with a kid who could who who did that before so and this. I don't think I don't think that side of the line gave up gave up a single sack last year playing in the in the G, in the SEC like you know what I mean so like that's pretty good that's pretty good football there as well mm-hmm. um, National Signing Day isn't what it used to be um, it wasn't what it used to be but um, it's still pretty big so uh, two guys two names two names everybody's talking about and would be Deuce Robinson is a, a guy who is kind of deciding between um, he's also a baseball player too so. Side between USC and deciding between um, and Georgia, and then you have um, oh, man, what's the other guy's name? Oh, I can't remember his name now. Roger Pleasant. Oh, yeah, yeah, Roger yeah. Pleasant, um, the cornerback who was just all, he's just all gifted corner 
who would definitely help. Um, we had we good to kind of land that guy. I guess if you had to have, if you could only get one of them, I, Pleasant would probably be for California recruiting and the defense probably be, probably be the best one. But, you know, at USC, we're greedy. We like to eat. So we want everybody. Uh, what are your thoughts about those two? Yeah, I definitely agree. We, we like to get everybody, everybody we, get we everybody. can. Um, you know, but I think basically as far as Deuce goes, you know, obviously early on there's a lot of optimism, you know, because you – you look at him, you're like, he could be the next Mark Andrews. You know, he could be that next tight end wide receiver guy. Lincoln Riley just, you know, is able to do basically everything with, you know, like Mark Andrews in Oklahoma was just nuts. And he's actually gone to obviously be very good at the NFL uh, as well, actually. And um, with Roger Pleasant, all the signs kind of seemed to point to USC. And you saw how how heavy guys were recruiting him at the Poly Bowl. Same, same with Deuce, obviously. Mm -hmm. But going back to Deuce, just kind of complicated because then Georgia seemed to be an overwhelming favorite. At about that time during the early signing period, you know, up through now, it's when Georgia's really kind of taking the lead. But at the same time, you're hearing things from uh, from the analysts, the recruiting analysts say that, oh, well, U.S. people we've talked to, they they like their chances. And it's like, well, yeah, they like their chances, but of course they're going to like their chances. You know, they're, they're kind of on that USC side of things. So it's just kind of tough. And you look at how – I definitely think USC is number two. I know there's talk that, you know, Alabama and Texas are still in it. I, I don't really think they are. I haven't really heard yeah, no, no. anything, anything about them. And, no. um, they they, they want to be they, 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 Texas wants to be in it, but they're not in it. Yeah, Texas, they yeah. definitely <laughs> want to be in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but as far as Roger Pleasant goes, it seems like all the signs are kind of pointing towards him. Coming to USC, there hasn't been like, you know, a ton of big predictions I've seen from analysts. But obviously, the thing that really stands out is him having his last visit at USC. Um, you know, that's a big one, you know, him getting that kind of last the last opportunity for him to be swayed towards what college he wants to go to. And, um, you know, he, he's, you know, a local guy. And, mm -hmm. you know, like we talked about him being able to be around all those guys at the poly ball. Like if, if USC was already having momentum at that time, now they are having even more momentum because they had Zach Branch and, yeah. and Malachi Nelson and Makai Lemon all in his ear, you know. So yeah, exactly. that's such huge. I think is if you can get one of those guys, you're in good shape. If you can get both, that's just outstanding. Yeah. Um, but, you know, don't – if you only get one of them, don't necessarily hang your head because there's – like I said, there's still going to be more opportunities for transfer portal guys. Yep. There's still going to be more opportunities to maybe climb up the recruiting ratings if you're following that, things like that. So, you know, just take what you get. And if you don't get deuce, you know, it is what it is. And I will say as far as Roger Pleasant goes, a lot of those schools just aren't the football programs that USC is that he's looking at, like – you know, he's looking at Boston College, UCLA. You know, those programs aren't just – they're not – they don't really carry as much as a USC does in recruiting. So, I think there's – you know, that doesn't really have me worrying as much. Whereas with Dukes, it's like, you know, Georgia is obviously coming off a national championship. They have all the momentum in the world. And I also think that – what like, what else – I think the thing about it is, like, what else does – unless you're a huge Nike fanatic, like, what else is – I think that's another – that's the pitch that I've been hearing people say is, like, what does Oregon have to offer besides that? Like, you know what I mean? Like they have, I mean, like, I'm not saying, I'm not saying they, they're going to be a good program. They're going to be kids who want to go there. They want to have 25 different uniforms. That's fine. Um, And they're going to be a good team. But I do wonder like, what else do they have to offer besides that? I mean, I think Los Angeles offers, and LA is not for everybody. I get it. But um, that's going to be something that um that people have to think about as well. I think also, can SC fans lay off Kyle Ford, man? Like, I mean, I, I like, I like Kyle Ford. I, I, I know you like Kyle Ford as well. Like, I mean, he, he was a solid player, but when you look at all the influx of offensive wide receiver weaponry, and I think, I think, I think another kid's coming too. I think the other, um, the other wide receiver might be coming as well. Like you got to sit there and think that if you're Kyle Ford and the way Brendan Rice played in the, in the um, cotton bowl, that it's going to be a tough spot for him to get any burn. Even though he played well when he did, it makes sense for him to go to UCLA. Yeah, it does make sense. Uh, it just kind of sucks. Obviously that it was UCLA, but you know, I, I like to root for all Trojans, you know, even if they leave USC, I like to root yeah. for them wherever they go. It's just kind of how it's always been with me. Um, I know there, there's some fans, you know, Pitt fans, Oklahoma fans, they kind of just root against whoever transfers away or whatever, but, you know, as we've seen. But, you know, for me, that's not necessarily the case. And, you know, as far as does it make sense, it absolutely does make sense because, you know, well, I think that obviously Dorian Singer and Mario Williams, are, they're going to be number one and two right now. And this is just going off of what it looks like right now, because that's what Kyle Ford has to look at. You know, he can't just say, oh, yeah, you know, I really hope that I can, you know, jump into one of those top two spots or find a way to start over Taj and Brendan Rice and stuff like that. Like, I, I personally think that he should have done that in the sense that you can, you know, you can really compete and it would kind of sharpen your iron, it would sharpen your game. 
you can really just improve yourself. And I think that if you are that number four or five guy in a Lincoln Rally offense, you're going to still get reps. You're going to be playing in big games. So you could get some good tape out there. Mm-hmm. But like, just I also understand where he's coming from because, like you said, the way that Taj and, like you said, Brendan Rice played in that bowl game, those two, I think, really separate themselves for competing for that wide receiver three spot. And the wide receiver four spot is probably going to be that next guy, you know. Mm-hmm. So he has to go off of what he's seeing right now, especially with USC bringing in um, what it's going to look like two four star receivers, which is Kobe Lane now looking like he's going to come to USC. Yeah, so Jeff Lane, yeah. Plus, Zachariah Branch was a five star receiver. It's just there's a lot kind of coming into this program. And it's, it's just not exactly how things were supposed to pan out for Ford due to just injuries setting him back. So, you know, now he looks for his fresh start and, you know, good luck to him. Yeah, good luck with no questions. So I did have a question. Um, and thank you for sending questions um to the show. We appreciate it. So I'll I'll pose a question to my I'll answer it when you after you finish answering it um for yourself here. Two, give me a the fan wants to know James from Florida, who's a USC fan out there. He wants to know what um two what two guys, give him two guys from the transfer portal who you think will be make the biggest impact, one offensive and one defensive player. All right. Offensive, I'll say Dorian Singer because I just think that he's going to be plugged into that role that Addison was in. Yeah. And I think he's a guy that, you know, he's a possession receiver who I think also has a lot of athleticism. You can use him down the field. You could ask USC about that. He kind of, kind of burned them for some pretty big plays last year. Mm-hmm. And there's just a lot of things that he can do as far as ball skills go, as far as big play, big play making ability goes. And just the numbers he put up last year were outstanding. And that was with a quarterback who was – I'm not. I'm not trying to hate on Jay and Delora or whatever, but they weren't on the same page at times. There was the the play of the video of them yes. like fighting yeah. on the sideline or whatever. So I think things will be a little bit better for him. You know, being able to pick his next school, play with the Heisman winner. Um, and then I'll say on defense, it's got to be Mason Cobb just because he kind of feels exactly what USC needs. Yep. You know, at a position of need, at linebacker, he's going to find a way to start no matter what. And they're going to have a tough time taking him off the field. And when you look at his numbers, especially his tackle numbers, you know. Everyone says USC needs to be better at tackling. He is that guy. So those are two for me. For me, I'm going to go um, offensively. I'm going to go with Mar- Marshawn Lloyd. i got a breakdown with him coming up later this week. So um, definitely stay, to, stay tuned to the channel for that. I'm going to go um, – I'm going to stay on, on the defense. I think Makai Blackton is going to be – I wish he had one more one more year. One more. I wish he came back because, I mean, he would be oh, such true. a I, – I love watching him play corner. Especially what you see on all twenty-two, but I think uh, Christian Roland Christian Roland Wallace is going to be a huge. It has to be has to be a huge factor. He kind of has to step in and be what Blackton was, um, as far um, as far as just being able to cover and shut down the side and and, and be able to tackle as well. Um, I would say and I'll give you a third guy who I think um, I can't say his last name, but Edward Suplant Suplicky. I'm okay. telling you, I'm telling you, dude, like the Ra- I am on our show, the Raiders, the Raiders um, put on with Raiders podcast and on this podcast, we probably talk more about special teams than any other podcast out there. And special teams has, was the single reason why they lost some of these games and he has a leg. So him being able, him being able to just pound, put, pin people back, force teams to have to go 80 yards, 90 yards um, against the, against the USC defense give you more opportunities for turnovers in your own end where, you know, give Caleb Williams a short field. That would, that should be huge, um, huge things for, um, for, for USC. And I think there is a kicker out here where I'm out. I'm where I live out here in, in San Diego. The um, kid from, I think it's kid from Encinitas who um, is a, who could be uh, in the a recruit for place kicking, which is, you know, not, not I know Dennis Leary, the Dennis, um, Dennis um, what, what, I forgot his last name. Lynch. Lynch. And I, I'm almost at Dennis Leary, like, 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 like the comedian. But um, <laughs> but but Dennis Lynch was, you know, the you know, I remember watching one of the one of the games back, and he was like five for ten on the season. And we just you, you gotta yeah. get you, you gotta get you had you gotta get more. Like if you look at here's the thing that I look at for USC is if you look at that, I think I forgot who um TC was playing, but I, I remember TC TC was playing late in the season and they ran a play. And it was like a fire drill. They got their offense off the field and they got their field goal unit on the field within like three or four seconds. The time's running down. They have no timeouts left and they were able to kick a, kick a field goal to stay um, in, in the national championship picture. Like, could USC do that if they needed to do that? 
Like, you know what I mean? Because, like, I mean, that's something that you got to be able to do, right? And, and, and you never know. I mean, you're especially with the schedule, right? You got to be able to be able to make, make big-time kicks. And I think them getting a big-time kicker would be huge um, for this program to, to, to be able to be able to kick um, big field goals and also be able to pin people back um, on touchbacks and um, on punts as well. So it should be interesting to see what happens there. But, yeah, but keep, 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 those, keep those questions coming in. That's always cool to um, – Talk to the fans as well too. So, um, talk, talk transfer portal. Talked a lot. Talked offensive line, um, um, and no impact. I don't think there's gonna be any big impact from the guys who are leaving. Um, you know, so I mean, some of those guys. Are, I mean, like it just makes sense for them to leave. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Um, last thing I guess I would say is, do you feel like uh, Lucas getting Lucas getting some of the guys up front? Um, Keon Barnes from Arizona. You feel like that is an, I mean, that's obviously not enough. The problem is, is it seems like um, some of these guys who are the big plugs up the middle, they don't leave the South. Like they, 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 they're, they're, and they almost joke. Somebody was just, somebody in recruiting was joking about how their mama's boys, like they just don't, they, they really, they, they, they just stay in Georgia. They stay in Alabama. They stay there. And that's, that's kind of the, those guys, you don't get those guys on the West Coast. No, that's true. It's they also just don't seem to enter the portal very often. I've also no. noticed, which yeah, honestly, but that that's all related, honestly. And because you know, we, we have a tough time getting those kinds of kids in high school, you know, in California and just the West in general. But it's so important to the other ones that you, that you have the opportunity to recruit. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's just tough because you know, you add Jack Sullivan, you add Anthony Lucas, and those are good guys to have on the ends. But, you know, you don't really have a stud in, you know, up the middle, like you said. I like Tyrone Teleni. I thought he played well last year, mm-hmm. um, kind of quietly, you know, especially, you know, like with um, that forced fumble he had against UCLA. I mean, he set us up in like the red zone, you know. So yeah. I actually thought that he played pretty well, but there's not really a stud there. I think Keon Barnes is definitely a good guy to kind of pair with him as far as just upgrading this defensive line in, in the, the DT spot in general, the nose tackle spot, because the guys that are leaving, kind of like as you mentioned, whether that's with the portal or whether that's with just, you know, running out of eligibility on the defensive line, they really yeah. weren't as good as what we're going to have next year. Mm-hmm. Um, that's no like shot at them, but, you know, I just, I never really felt that Brandon Peely, Nick Figueroa, those kinds of guys, um, you know, um, Kobe Pepe, I never really felt like those guys would really have lived up to their potentials. Um, Nick Figueroa did have a really good um, pandemic year though, but I just, you know, yeah. last year I didn't really feel like he was playing to the best of his abilities. And so I think you're definitely gonna have an upgrade where you're at. But like you said, it's just tough to really kind of make that big jump as far as that position goes. And so you're really just hoping that you get a lot of production from the DNs that you picked up. And, um, you know, hopefully we get that kind of breakout from Corey Foreman. Yeah, I mean, we're still waiting for that Corey Foreman breakout, so we'll see. And maybe some of these defensive linemen could actually play downhill and not drop in coverage so much. <laughs> yeah. like, that might that might be – but that's a, that's, a, that's a story for another day. A story for another day. Yeah. All right, Evan. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you for joining us here on the Sitting by Right USC podcast. We appreciate you all always, man. Take care. Uh, thank you, bro. Yep. Everybody, peace out. Fight on.